Um, this is more than just serialization, I mean. So Quick Check is a, is a program that does, uh, it's a Haskell library, it's just a library, not really an application at all. It's a library that does software testing, random testing. And the way it works is this. You, uh, you have some function you've written, um, and uh, like reverse, and you wish to test some property of reverse. So the first thing you do is you write a Haskell function called PropRev in this case. It doesn't matter what it's called. And it takes a, um, uh, it takes a list of integers to a Boolean. And it returns, it returns true if when you reverse the list of integers twice, you get the same thing as you started with. Right? That should be a property that reverse has. And you can write lots of properties. Here's a property involving um, prop rev app involves a property that involves reversing and appending. So you can write these properties, and then you just call quick check applied to prop rev. So prop rev is this function. So you apply quick check to the function, and quick check has a little pause and then says, fine, I passed 100 tests and I couldn't make it return false. Right, this function should always return true. And then I can call quick check on prop web app, even though it has a different type. And again, it does 100 tests and says, uh, I couldn't make it return false. Now, clearly, something interesting is happening because quick check has to make uh, test cases to work. And the test cases themselves, in the case of the first one, it had to make test cases that were lists of integers. In the second one, it had to make test cases that were pairs of lists of integers. Because there are two arguments. So here in one slide is how uh, quick check works. Um, so this is, uh, this is a rather accelerated introduction to type classes. So uh, <laughs> quick check has a, uh, remember, quick check took as its, as its argument the function that you want to test. Uh, so it's the type of quick check is it takes an A to an IO unit, but the, it prints its results. That's the IO unit part. Um, but the A must lie in testable, or just uh, here, I'll just write in class test. And class test has a single function in it called test with A to random to bool. Why? Why the random? Well, we need to feed it random numbers in order, or quick check will need to feed it random numbers in order to uh, test it at different values. Now, the interesting thing is how do you test a function value? Because remember, the arguments we're going to give it are functions. So we need to make test, we need to give an instance for test that arrows. Well, here it is. Here is the uh, instance, the test, the, uh, the, the um, blob of code at the bottom here that says test A arrow B is the arrow case, um, the arrow instance for test. So how do you test a function? Well, you can test a function if you can test the result of the function, that is, if you can test B, and if you can construct arbitrary values of the argument type. That's the RBA. What's RB? RB is a class that says, if, I, if you're in class RB, then there's a function RB, which given a random number will produce a value of this type. So now how do I test the function? How do I, now I've got to provide a witness for test, right? So test gets a, an F, a function F, that's this guy, and a random number, that's R. And how does he do it? He recursively calls test on the result of applying F to a test argument. What test argument? Answer, RB applied to a random number. Oh, and I better split the random number I get into two different ones, so I need a random number supply that I can split into two. Isn't that beautiful? You all understand that, of course, don't you? But, but let, believe me, it's worth going to read the quick check paper, because this is, this is, this is a programming pearl, right? The fact that it, this, this, the whole idea of quick check fits in in just one slide. Thank goodness for the shift key. Thank goodness for the shift key. Oh, right, yes, yes, it's very important. Haskell is case sensitive. Okay, so enough about, uh, enough about a particular example. So, so one way in which type classes gave rise to un, un, unexpected fertility was the, um, uh, in the applications that people found for them, but also they gave rise to unexpected fertility in the variants and developments that have arisen since. And I'm, you'll be relieved to hear that I'm not going to go through any of these, except to say that they're, most, they're sketched in the paper with uh, forward references to, to further reading. It's proved to be a much sort of richer scene than we had initially anticipated, and that was but that turned out that's really very exciting um, thing, to, uh, uh, thing to happen to you when it does. So here we are. Here's a summary of the, the type class story. Um, much more far-reaching than we initially expected. Um, and um, and uh, uh, so somewhat influential, you know, has been adopted by various other languages. But there is, a, there is the, de the lurking danger of heat death, right? That's, that's this picture, really. We, uh, the moment where it's still in the stage in which we keep lobbing more and more elaborations into type classes in the hope that eventually we'll understand, understand some grand unified theory that will make it all simple again. But at the moment, we're still at the stage of making it more complicated. And so it's unclear to me what ultimately the long term, in 20 years' time, what will we say about type classes? I don't know. But it's been a lot of fun, meanwhile. OK. So here we are, about, about five or 10 minutes? Nine. Nine. Good. Good. Nine, exactly. Uh, 
So I just wanted to say a little bit um, to, to wrap up with about the process and uh, community of the, uh, the, the bunch of people who've been involved in Haskell. So one thing to say is that Haskell is a committee language. And it's common to expect committee languages to be very baroque and complicated because they're composed of lots of compromises. And in some ways, Haskell is. But then we certainly did not have a supreme leader. We did not have a, a, a Linus Torvald or a Bjarne Stroestrup to, to, uh, to, um, to be, be clearly in command, however much. I'm sure, Bjarne, you don't feel in command. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but in many other communities, there has been one person who's clearly been the, the lead player. And there really hasn't been a lead player in the Haskell community, a single one. And that's, uh, so that's, that's led to a lot, lots of give and take. However, the group that we, um, that we designed Haskell with did have a, a kind of fairly clearly articulated goal. And they were fairly motivated, and we uh, pretty much trusted each other. So that was, that's uh, not necessarily easy to re reproduce, but that, that turned out to work pretty well. And we tried to resolve unnecessary conflicts by always having an editor who was the current person who would uh, cause... Um, cause discussions to move forward and force us to come to a conclusion of some kind. And for syntactic matters, we appointed a person who wasn't necessarily the same as the editor, but often was, called the syntax czar. And the syntax czar was empowered to make arbitrary decisions. They seldom did, but in principle they could, because we all know that syntax is the, uh, the place where committees really start to lose their way. Um, curiously, though, people often uh, uh, say how much they like Haskell syntax, despite its committee origins. Another interesting thing about the committee is that we disbanded ourselves in 1999, pretty much as soon as Haskell 98 was out. We disbanded ourselves, so now there is no Haskell committee, the idea being we're giving the language back to the community and waiting to see whether enough of them will uh, step up to do, to do something further with it. So there really isn't a command and control economy, even of the democratic kind we had before. I wanted to say a little bit about language complexity as well. So we talked quite a lot about language complexity at this meeting. And, uh, uh, I've uh, written down here what um, Nicholas said on one of his slides yesterday, uh, that uh, languages are full of dispensable complexity. And I think one could criticize Haskell for being full of dispensable complexity, right? There's, there's certainly a lot of superficial complexity. All this type classes stuff, there's lots of redundant, mutually redundant syntax, the data types are very rich. There's a, um, so, it, I mean, it goes on and on. The Haskell report is pretty fat. It's not as thin as many of the languages that we've talked about today. But at the same time, there is, it is underpinned by some fairly deeply held principles that I want to say um, um, something about in a moment, but not so deeply held that we actually wrote a formal semantics. That was one of our initial goals, and it's a goal that we abjectly failed to meet. I, uh, and I don't even know whether I regret to say that or not. It's, uh, I would love to have a formal semantics, but it, does, it, makes you, it also makes you less nimble. So uh, it is what it is. We don't have a formal semantics. I'm not proud of it, but I'm not too ashamed of it either. What do I mean by these deeply held principles? I really do think that the people who uh, built Haskell um, did have quite strongly held principles for the way you should build a programming language. Um, but I then had tried to think, all right, so how could I articulate that in a concrete form? So this is the best I can do. This is GHC's intermediate language for Haskell. So we translate Haskell into a small intermediate language that is essentially the lambda calculus uh, in the style of system F. So it's an explicitly typed lambda calculus um, with higher order polymorphism. It's, it's something very close to system F, a little bit more developed. And I'm not really hiding anything from you here. I'm showing you pretty much the whole thing. So in, this is the data type of expressions, and it has, uh, is it eight constructors? And I've even included a very seldom used one called note, which just adds some random annotation. You could drop that without any loss. This is the whole thing. The only thing I'm not showing you here is the representation for types, which show up here and there, right? What, how is a type represented? Well, it's another half dozen constructors. And that's it. So this is a great sanity check. So this is the way I think of it. We start off with a very large language, the Haskell gorilla, and we squeeze him down, making him smaller and smaller into this very, he's, he's sort of shrinking, the incredible shrinking gorilla, until he gets into these uh, eight constructors. And anything that doesn't fit into that plan doesn't get in. So that's what I mean by a kind of underlying conceptual simplicity, is that the, everything in Haskell can be explained by this rather elaborate um, uh, translation. But nevertheless, a translation ultimately gets you to this incredibly small language. Um, and GHC has survived with this very small language for 17 years now. I think we were one of the first ones to use an explicitly typed system F style intermediate language. And the same one is still doing the job. We have elaborated it a bit recently. Um, to deal with uh, type families. I want to say just a little bit about Haskell users. So um, the Haskell users are a, a, uh, not a very large group. I mean, it's, sort of, it's now thousands, but not millions of people. 
Um, and they're incredibly tolerant. So um, I, the, my, 